Mark is going to lead us through Deuteronomy chapters 29 and 30. And uh, then he's going to preach a message called The Choice of a Lifetime. Okay, what I'll do is I'm going to read the slide header up here and then we will read the verses of Scripture together. Because as Pastor Earl just said, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. We speak it, we read it, and we bring it into our hearts, our minds, and our soul. So, Deuteronomy, we are going to be studying Deuteronomy 29 and 30 tonight. Lord, first of all, we pray for you to bless the hearing. Open hearts and minds, your word tells us that you bring your Holy Spirit to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive your message. Lord, we pray for that opening. We pray for that spirit to fall over the nation. That we have a turning back to you. That there is a freshness in this nation. That it returns to its Christian heritage, its Christian principles. That you save our nation as you've told us in the promises of Scripture. And so we pray, we pray for your anointing that the words of my mouth and the utterances that you have given to me are your words and that it stirs hearts and minds tonight for us to do the things we need to do for the saving of this nation. We ask this all in our beloved Savior Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right, Deuteronomy 29. Know your history, the importance of God's moral code. It's been given to us two times. These are the words of the covenant that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant that he had made with them in Horeb. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs of those great wonders. The work of the Holy Spirit eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive. But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn off your feet. You have not eaten bread, and you have not drunk wine or strong drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came to this place, Sion, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, but we defeated them. God's covenant, he's good for his word. Keep your end of the agreement. We took their land and gave it for an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of the Manassites. Keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, that he may establish you today as his people, and he be your God as he promised to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Idolatry is a curse to its practitioners. It is not with you alone that I am making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord our God and with whoever is not here with us today. Beware lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of all these nations. The Lord will single him out from all the tribes of Israel for calamity in accordance with all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. Nations are overthrown by idol worship, externally or internally. Then people will say, it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them, and went and served other gods and worshipped them, whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it all the curses written in this book, and uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land as they are this day. Worship by remembering and rejoicing in what the Lord has done and provided. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. 
that we, we may do all the words of his law. The all-knowing God knows wrong choices will be made. Turn and obey the restorer. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and life. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you, and bring you into the land that your fathers possessed. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live and will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. Our role is to fulfill the greatest commandment. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, cattle, and ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, as he took delight in your fathers when you obey the voice of the Lord your God, to keep his commandments written in this book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. I am shows himself to us in creation and word. Not my will, but yours be done. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. The choice is between God, the Creator, and idol worship, the created. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God by loving Him, walking in His ways, keeping His commandments, statutes, and His rules, then you shall live and multiply and he will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of. But if your heart turns away, not you, worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. Choose life, love, obey, and hold fast to him. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them. Our message, it's titled, The Choice of a Lifetime. We have uh, five sections of the lesson tonight. Do you like stories or movies or epic adventures with a heroic lead character pursuing a love interest, such as Braveheart or The Lord of the Rings? Our study of Deuteronomy 29 and 30 are the cliff notes or author's outline of the story, his story, told in the entirety of the Bible. First section. Moses reminds Israel of God's requirements, terms and promises, right here. In our epic novel, the requirements for the bride are laid out. Second section, 29, 14 to 28, idolatry, forsaking God, brings curses individually and nationally. The intended is captured by a rival through deception and lies, keeping her from the one who loves her. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Respect what is God's. 
Pursue what is revealed in the Word. In our story, it's open, the opening of the forbidden door provides the villain access to kidnap the Lord's intended. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 18. The bridegroom pursues the bride. The hero shows to what extent he will go to rescue and redeem his intended from the clutch and deception of the enemy. In our part 5, Deuteronomy 30, 19 and uh, 20, the bride submits from love, not coercion. The Hebrew rescues his intended bride, the relationship is restored, and the wedding feast begins. God lays out the choices to live in his house, creation. There is the easy path for those that obey, which is the path to eternal life with God, or the hard way of punishment and discipline. Continued disobedience ultimately leads to a total hardening of the heart and eternal banishment a lifetime consequence. The Lord does not reveal when the continued resistance results in his hardening of the heart. Next slide. So our first uh, lesson, part one, Deuteronomy 29, verses 1 through 13. Moses lays out God's offer to the people of the na nation of Israel. The requirements for the bride are laid out. The groom lays out his requirements to his intended bride. God lays out before the Israelites the operating manual for life. The operation of life is to have a loving relationship with God by voluntarily accepting his requirements. The obedience is not forced or compelled by God. Scripture, we have to see in verse, uh, 1 Samuel verses 12, uh, 14 through 16. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandments of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reign over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Next slide. Deuteronomy 29, verses 2 and 3. You've seen all that the Lord did in Egypt, the great trials your eyes saw, the signs and great wonders. Matthew Henry's commentaries on this first section of uh, Scripture, uh, Deuteronomy 29, 1 through 9, notes that both former mercies and fresh mercies should be thought of by us as motives to obedience. The hearing ear and seeing eye and the understanding heart, they're all gifts of God. All that have them, have them from Him. God gives not only food and raiment, but wealth and large possessions to many, to whom he does not give grace. Grace is another gift. Many enjoy the gifts who have not hearts to perceive the giver, nor the true design and use of the gifts. We are bound in gratitude and interest as well as in duty and faithfulness to keep the words of the covenant. Proverbs 29, 12 tells us, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made both of them. Deuteronomy 29, verse 13, he says that he may establish you today as his people, as he promised you and your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God has shown the Israelites that he keeps his promises. He's good for his word. He fulfilled his promises to the patriarchs, his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would make their offspring into a nation. Genesis 15, 5 and 6, and then again in 13, 16, promises he made to Abraham, and he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you were able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, 
and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that you, they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a, in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And again in Genesis 26, God renews the covenant with Isaac and expands it to reveal that all nations will be blessed through Isaac's offspring. The foretelling that the Savior is coming through Isaac's seed. The covenant is again renewed through Jacob, or Israel, as he's renamed by God in Genesis 28:35. These people led by Moses out of Egypt and to the entry point of the promised land lived the fulfillment of these promises of God. We have God's promises made more sure to us that have seen the fulfillment of his salvation plan in Christ Jesus. We have the answer to the problems to show people the extent of God's love for them and his desire to have a relationship with them. The answer is the love of God revealed to us in Christ Jesus. In Benson's commentary in this section of scripture, the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, which he would have done had you sincerely and earnestly desired and asked it of him. And you're found, you're in, found without excuse that you have not considering his signal or his single mercies on the one hand and his awful judgments on the other, of which you have had such great experience and which called loudly upon you to humble yourselves before him in true repentance and seek his grace to enable you to understand and approve by such extraordinary dispensations and wonderful works. For he does not speak thus to excuse their wickedness, but to direct them to whom they must have recourse for a good understanding of God's works. And to intimate that although the hearing ear and the seeing eye be the workmanship of God, yet their want of these was their own fault and the just punishment of their former sins. They had all this evidence, they failed to see it, failed to heed it, failed to hear it, and put it into practice. They chose to go their own way. James 4, verse 2 through 8 tell us, You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or hatred with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Again, we are not without excuse. We are without excuse. God's promises are clearly evident to us. And with prayer, supplication, he opens our eyes, our hearts, our minds to receive those. It is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. Deuteronomy 7, 8. What God truly desires is a relationship with us. It's a love relationship. As Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 through 10 tell us, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. From the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, know therefore that the Lord your God is Lord, your God, and that he is faithful. God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those, excuse me, I just lost my place here, sorry about that. 
The faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. God's, command, God's commandments are about how we are to show love. Commandments 1 through 4 tell us how God wants us to worship Him. The terms He, the Creator, has set for us to show our love for Him. Commandments 5 through 10 are our relationships with our fellow man and woman. Love for other people shows our love for God's children and by extension our love for their Father and our Father. Again, we have the commandments and God is setting out his relationship, how he wants to be worshipped, and how we are to treat our fellow creatures. 1 John 4, 7, 10 tells us, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. The word propitiation means it's an act of appeasing wrath and conciliating the favor of an offended person. Man has offended God. He sent his son Jesus to be the propitiation, that payment, that conciliation, so that we who offended the holy and mighty and merciful God can now come back into his favor. Romans 1, 19 and 20 tells us, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Again, God has shown us how to come into his presence how to understand him, receive his word in our hearts, receive these promises that he has given to the people, the blessings and the curse, and if we receive those, that we are in right relationship with him. So if we don't recognize those things, he's going to bring the disciplines. The fault lies with each person for rejecting the evidence God puts in front of them. It's clearly evident in nature and in God's word it is all before us, and it is readily available to us. Part 2, Deuteronomy 29, 14 through 28. Idolatry, the forsaking of God, brings curses, both individually and nationally. The hero tells his intended what will happen if she fails to obey his requirements, given in love to protect her. He also tells her how she is to show her love and obedience to him. Israel is warned of the consequences of turning from God's way, the straight and narrow path. Deuteronomy 29, verse 18. Beware lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. The message is clear. Moses repeats the warning. Beware. This is hazardous, toxic, lethal. What is the source of this turning? Did you catch it? The root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. Who turned Eve's desire to focus on the forbidden tree? the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 17. Again, why we teach all of the Bible, the understanding from Genesis through Revelation. We need to know God's Word. 
But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. God's instruction found in the verses is Genesis 2, 15 through 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded him, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The enemy brings deception and doubt to mankind and the veracity of God's command. In Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The turning from God's way came through Satan via a tree a plant with roots that bears fruit, a poisonous fruit that brought knowledge of good and evil. Deuteronomy 29 verses 19 and 20 tells us, the one who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry, that is, young and old alike. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And the curses written in this book will settle upon him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Jesus reveals the mission of the enemy and contrasts that with his mission. You find this in John 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Deuteronomy 29, 28. The Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land. God foretells the apostasy of the nation of Israel. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it all the curses written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land as they are to this day. Our beloved USA is forced or is faced with being uprooted or overrun in our land through the turning away from our founding as a Christian nation, governed by a constitution rooted in the principles of God's word. Our founders issued warnings to us of what would happen if we forsook our founding principles and heritages. Benjamin Franklin said, I agree to this Constitution. I believe further that this is likely to be well administered for a course of years. It can only end in despotism as other forms have done before it. When the people shall become so corrupted as to need despotic government being incapable of any other. The despotism in government is evident through the treatment of those arrested for exercising their First Amendment right on January 6, 2021, compared to how the murderers left out on the street under bail reform. We saw that happening over the course of 2020 and continuing to this day. Thomas Jefferson, another founder, our government is now taking so steady a course as to show by what road it will pass to destruction, to wit, by consolidation first and then corruption. The engine of consolidation will be the federal judiciary, the two other branches, the corrupting and corrupted instruments. 
The Supreme Court decision in Engel versus Vitale removed from prayer, removed prayer from schools, I should say, through an erroneous application of the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment. James Madison, if Congress can employ money indefinitely for the group general welfare and are the sole and supreme judges of the, um, judges of the general welfare, they may take the care of religion into their own hands, they may appoint teachers in every state, county, and parish, and pay them out of the public treasury. They may take into their own hands the education of children, the establishing in like manner schools throughout the Union. They may assume the provision of the poor were the power of Congress to be established in the latitude contended for it, would subvert the very foundations and transmute the very nature of the limited government established by the people of America. We see Madison's concern as well founded in the government. We have a public education, we have public welfare, we have the, suppress of the suppression of protestment Christianity through censorship. It's even more graphic in the funding of the Ukraine instead of securing the borders of our own United States. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary secure or safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And again, Franklin, without freedom of thought, there can be no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as public liberty without freedom of speech. Apostasy. It's an abandon, abandonment of what one has professed, a total desertion and department, departure from one's faith or religion. We are living in a land of apostasy, of people that turned away from our founding principles. And ultimately, this land, this nation, is reaping what it's sown. <clears throat> Proverbs 4.14 tells us, do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil. The only answer to the problems found in our nation are through a return to our foundation, the application of the Bible to every aspect of life, including civics. This is the message of Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. What we need is mature Christians, people that know, understand the Word of God to become mentors and guides to the parents of the children of this nation. We need to restore the education of the children. Some of the areas of work, God's Word that has been taken out of the schools that can be focused on and need to be focused on is a study of the Ten Commandments. We need a study of the Proverbs. We need to go back to the ABCs of Psalm 119. Pastor Earl referred to Psalm 119 in his, um, his lessons last week, and really there's a number of uh, the sections of, of uh, Psalm 119 that fall, fall into line that we need to heed as well. And then, as, again, is what we do in the study of God's Word here, Liberty Christian Fellowship, a line-by-line -line study of Scripture. And that needs to be brought into the education of the children. There are 30 or 31 days in a month and 31 Proverbs. We need to meditate on the Proverbs on a daily basis. As Proverbs 22.6 tells us, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. God clearly identifies how he is to wor be worshipped and what is offensive to him in the commandments. Psalm 119, again, these are the ABCs of Scripture. Psalm 119, it's an eight-verse cut. It's set up in an eight-verse couplet format, and each section begins with the Hebrew alphabet, and I refer to this as the A to Z of God's Word. Each eight-verse couplet or section gives 
us uh, in these 22 sections that are the, which are the 22 verses of, uh, or letters of the Hebrew al alphabet. Gives us, it's a focus on the law and ordinances of God as the directing influence for our lives. A couple of examples, Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Psalm 119, verse 32. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. And this fits in with what the section of scripture is tonight. That we need God to open our eyes, our ears, our hearts to receive his word. We need to teach children the Bible line by line like we study the word here at Liberty Christian Fellowship. God clearly identifies how he is to be worshiped and what is offensive to him in the commandments. Part three, Deuteronomy 29, 29. We need to respect what is God's and pursue what is revealed in the word. The hero, the hero has, esta has established an area that only he is to access. The curiosity of the intended to opening an entryway, a portal for the villain to access the intended and abducts her. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 tells us, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Digging into the secret things of God results in a world of trouble. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was something that God kept secret. The serpent, Satan, deceived the woman to take something God reserved for himself and ushered in a world of trouble. It brought theft, destruction, and death. God tells us he numbers our days. The evil one has deceived mankind into the deception that man can determine if a child is to be born or not. The fallacious statement of my body, my choice, that is a lie from the pit of hell. The supporters of abortion promote this lie until it comes to the government determining that for public good, a person must take an injection of a chemical cocktail into their body through mandating injections. Then they cry, you must take this injection, it's for the public good. This is an absolute violation of the place God created for meeting with his intended, the sacred temple. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 tells us, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Governments are looking to determine when people die. We see involuntary euthanasia occurs in other nations. We saw this in the Holocaust and the rise of communism in Russia and China. We're seeing this taking place in our neighbors to the north in Canada now. The practice of witchcraft and sorcery is an attempt to discover the things of God through other means beside his revealed word. God reveals the mystery of the gospel. Ephesians 3, 3 through 6 tells us the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was, was, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations and has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Benson's commentary on this verse of scripture says, secret things belong unto the Lord our God. That is, the counsels and purposes of God concerning persons or nations and the reasons of his dispensations toward them, together with the time and manner of inflicting judgments or showing mercy, 
are hidden in his bosom and not to be pried into, much less fathomed or understood by us. But those which are revealed, namely, that if we rebel against him, he will pour out all these judgments upon us, except by true repentance and turning to him, we prevent it. These things belong to us and to our children, that statement in scripture, are the proper objects of our inquiries, that thereby we may know our duty, and by complying with it may be kept from such terrible calamities as these now mentioned. The ways and judgments of God, he says, though never unjust or often hidden from us, these are unsearchable by our shallow capacity and matter for our admiration, not our inquiry. But the things that are revealed by God in his word must be attended to and considered that we may be duly influenced by them. The way this is to be done is told to us in Romans 1, 17 through 23. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written. The righteous live by faith, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, that is, the things in nature, and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. We have no excuse. God's put everything right in front of us. For, all they, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They turned to make idols, false gods. We need to heed the warning of respecting what belongs to God and pursue the revealed things. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We need to focus our attention on God's word. Those are the things that he has revealed to us. <clears throat> Romans 11, 33 through 36 again tells us, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let us, again, seek the things that God has revealed to us in the study of Scripture, but let us not pursue the things that He has, in His own wisdom, kept secret to Himself. Part 4, Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 18. The bridegroom pursues the bride. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. The heart of the Lord pursues us like a suitor pursues his intended bride. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, that I, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, Neither it is too far off. Barnes notes in this section of scripture tells us the righteousness which is of faith is really and truly described in these words of the law and under Paul's guidance in scripture. We affirm was intended so to be. For the simplicity and accessibility which Moses is here attributing to the law of God neither is or can be experimentally found in it except through the medium of faith. Even though outwardly and in the letter of the law be written out for us so that he may run that readeth and be set forth in its duties and its sanctions as plainly as it was before the Jews by Moses. 
the seeming ease of the commandment and yet its real impossibility to the natural man form part of the qualification of the law to be our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Basically what this is saying is in the commandment, the bridegroom clearly lays out the choices. Verse 15, see I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. As noted earlier, the choice is stated in John 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Follow, if you don't follow God's path, take the difficult path, you're gonna be getting the path of difficulty. You're, you're pursuing your own self, your own interests. You're really doing what the, the enemy of God came. It's sinful pride, worshiping of self and not worshiping God the way he intends. Jesus, the way, the truth, the life, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The sinful man is unable to see and hear the things of God. His sinful heart is hardened to the things of God. Jesus explains this condition. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. This is John 6, verses 63 through 65. And all this knowledge of God, it is spiritual discerned. It is not flesh. It has to be the Spirit, the Spirit of God coming upon us. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. God has given us really how we are to go about fixing things. We've been focusing the last several weeks really on the answer, how we do come to the understanding and getting in the right ways with God. It's in 2 Chronicles 7:14. God summarizes for us the solution to our situation. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. So again, the solution for the penitent patriot is to follow the four ifs required by God so that he will then save our nation. When we humble ourselves, letting the Lord know that we are wholly dependent on him and his mercies, there is nothing that we bring to the table. Every good and perfect gift is from him through our redemption on the cross paid by our Savior Jesus. Our sins have been atoned for and we are covered by his holy precious blood. When we pray, we are praying by the Holy Spirit that it fall upon us to give ourselves the spiritual eyes and ears and hearts to accept the things of God and that others have those that heart, that eye to see, that ear to hear, to receive them as well. In our seeking of God's face, we are pursuing God diligently with devotion. We demonstrate our desire to forge our relationship with Him. We turn from our wicked ways when we repent. That is when we turn away from both our individual and our national sins. The skeptics say of the promises of God, it's too good to be true. The redeemed child of God with eyes of faith says, our God gives us His best. He desires the best for us, not evil to us. And so in Jeremiah 29, verse 11 through 13, he tells us, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So again, we're doing those four things, and God, tells us that then he will do the three things that he's promised to us. 
Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. The Lord pursues his children, seeking to motivate hearts to change and bring faith to them. The mystery of the Lord is that we do not know who will come to faith. That is one of the secret things of God. Deuteronomy 36, uh, verse 6 tells us that it is God that changes hearts. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Some hearts God changes as they come to recognize the goodness and blessing of God. Other hearts are changed when punishment and discipline falls on them for the bad choices made in life, and they realize through the Holy Spirit that they can only fix things by doing things God's way. God uses people and nations to execute his judgments on nations. We pray that hardened hearts receive the prompting of the Holy Spirit and not reach the point where God hardens the hearts as the heart of Zion's was, heart was hardened. We heard in uh, Deuteronomy 2, verses 30 and 31, when we were studying that section, but Zion, the king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate, that he might give him into your hand as he is this day. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have begun to give Zion and his land over to you. Begin to take possession that you may occupy his land. And the discipline and the punishment of God. We know the love and compassion of our Lord and pray for the revival and reawakening of our nation. Let people see and hear and know the goodness of God. We pray for the Holy Spirit to open hearts throughout this nation. Joel 2:13 and 14 and 28 and 29. We know the love of God and compassion of our Lord and pray for the revival and reawakening of our nation that the people hear so that they, we hear this. Joel 13. Return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And it's God's pouring out of the spirit that eyes are opened to see, hear, and hearts are changed to receive the blessings of God, the knowledge and understanding of Him. Part five, the bride submits from love, not coercion. 